Welcome to the Foley's Energy and Environmental Law Update web conference series. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I'll turn the conference over to Ms. Jennifer Bartz. Please go ahead. Greetings. I'm Jennifer Bartz with Foley and Lardner, and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's web conference. In this program, we address siting issues for renewable energy projects. Before I turn the presentation over to Sarah Slack to start things off, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Today's program will last approximately one hour. The PowerPoint presentation will be available on our website at Foley.com by early next week, or simply click the Download Files button along the right side of your screen to get a copy of the slides today. If you experience problems with Adobe Connect, please call 888-569 3848 for technology assistance. For audio assistance, dial star, then zero on your telephone to reach an operator. Today's program has been set up in both a discussion and interactive question and answer format. We encourage you to submit written questions during the program. Type your question into the Q&A box at the right side of the presentation slides. We will respond to your written questions and open the lines for live questions at the end of the program, time permitting. If we do not have time for Q&A at the end of the program, we will be sure to follow up with you offline. To ensure you get the most out of today's presentation, we encourage all participants to maximize the PowerPoint to full screen usage. You can do so by clicking the full screen button located above the slide. As a reminder, today's program is being recorded and will be available on Foley's website. Or again, you can get the slides by clicking on the Download Files box at the right of your screen. Foley will apply for CLE after the web conference. If you did not supply your CLE information upon registration, please send an email to myself, Jennifer Bart at jbartz at foley.com. Please note, those seeking New York and New Jersey CLE credit are required to complete the attorney affirmation form. A five-digit code will be announced during the presentation. Email the code to jbart at foley.com to get a copy of the form or simply click the Download Files button along the right-hand side of your screen to get a copy of the form today. Immediately fill out the form and return it after the program using the address on the form. At this time, I'll turn it over to Sarah. Thank you, Jennifer. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Slack, and I would like to welcome you to Foley and Lardner's Energy and Environmental Web Conference on Citing Issues for Renewable Energy Projects. Foley has a broad energy practice, and the firm has been providing counsel on electric utility matters for more than 100 years, and on greenfield development of wind and solar projects for more than 20 years. Foley has an experienced and adept energy industry team with attorneys who provide counsel on all aspects of utility matters. Our team members are located in offices across the country and assist clients with matters ranging from financing to permitting and due diligence, and from mergers and acquisitions to project siting, which is our topic today. Now I'd like to briefly introduce our speakers today, all of whom are members of the energy industry team. Our first speaker today is going to be Jason Barglow. Jason is a partner in the real estate group of Foley's Los Angeles, California office. Uh, speaking later today is Tanya O'Neill. Tanya is a partner in the environmental and energy group in Foley's Milwaukee, Wisconsin office. Uh, once again, that's me. My name is Sarah Slack. I'm a member of the environmental and energy group in Foley's Madison, Wisconsin office. Today we'll also be hearing from Dottie Watson, Dotty is a member of the Environmental and Energy Group in Foley's Orlando, Florida office. So our agenda today, as you know, is focused on siting issues. Uh, as those of you who have been involved in renewable projects know, this is by no means an exhaustive list of all issues that can and do come up uh, when siting renewable projects. But these are some common issues that arise at various sites. Now I'd like to turn it over to Jason Barglow. And Jason's going to be talking today about common real property title issues in renewable projects. Thanks very much, Sarah. Uh, so first of all, just some, uh, 
some uh, general themes for today, if I could change the slide. Uh, there we go. Okay. So as a general matter, matter all projects you know, are going to face some title issues. That's just kind of a, a fact of project development. So really, the key issue is, is generally you know, whether a given project site's title issues you know, are resolvable, and if so, at what cost and on what timeline, meaning can these things be resolved um, you know, relatively quickly and in a cost that's not going to kill, kill the project. And the ability to resolve these issues you know, often depends on spotting them early. So you know, kind of a common mistake that, that we see a lot is that uh, a developer will wait until you know, very late in the development process to conduct uh, you know, title review and, and due diligence. And, you know, that's, that's, you know, to some extent understandable. People don't want to spend money before they have to. But, you know, really the result of that very often is, uh, you know, it causes uh, severe project delays uh, or even project debt. You know, a delay in these projects really in some circumstances can kill the project. You often have deadlines under your, your PPA or, or your lease to, to start construction or even to start operating. So if you have delays and you, have to, and you end up missing those deadlines, that really can be, can be a big problem. Okay, so, so how, do you spot, how do you spot title issues in these kind of projects? And title matters are going to be shown uh, in the county real estate records, which are you know, kept in the county recorder's office. So really the best way to do this most efficiently is to obtain a title report from a commercial title company, which basically will be, you know, a nice written document that's going to show you all the exceptions to title that affect the property that is the subject uh, of your project. So the usual cost of these things uh, is about $700 for the title company, uh, and you know, even that cost can actually often be waived if you actually end up purchasing title insurance. And then there is, you know, some minor attorney review time involved as well. But as a general matter, it's a relatively small upfront investment, which I can guarantee you will, will save you lots of money uh, down the road. Okay, so what are some of the common title issues that we see on these projects? So number one is, is the issue of uh, severed mineral rights. This is an issue that, that I see, I would say, on you know, most of the projects that, that we work on. And so in this discussion, when I talk about mineral rights, I'm really using that term uh, uh, very broadly. So that, that's oil, gas, gold, other precious metals, and, and even geothermal energy uh, rights. So the general rule of property is that there is unified ownership of the surface estate and the mineral or subsurface estate, meaning that the property owner owns the rights to the property surface, as well as all rights that are beneath the surface for the extraction of, of, of minerals. But, but the, what you will see sometimes is there will be a severance of the mineral estate from the surface estate. And this can happen in a, in a variety of ways. Uh, there, can, there can be an express mineral estate lease where the property owner Will, will, will lease the subsurface or, or you know, mineral estate rights to a third party, say a uh, you know, oil and gas exploration company. Uh, or what you will see is a, is a mineral estate deed reservation or even an express uh, conveyance of the mineral estate. And what I mean by deed reservation is you'll have a landowner who some, at some time in the, in, the, in the chain of title over the past over many years, they will have conveyed the property to a third party but the, the deed or the instrument of conveyance will say, uh, you know, I convey this property to you, but I reserve to myself, uh, you know, all rights to the mineral estate or the subsurface uh, estate. Okay, so how do you know if the property that you're looking at has these, these seven mineral rights? And the way you can tell that again is, is from the title report. The, the, the title report will, will tell you whether there, there are seven mineral rights, and it will tell you the, the, who was the initial holder uh, of those rights. So the key question then is, 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 you know, what rights does the mineral estate holder have to use the property surface for mineral exploration? So the, 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 lease, convey, the lease, the conveyance, or the reservation can really 
treat this topic in, in one of three ways. It can either grant surface rights expressly, it can withhold surface rights, or it can be silent on the issue. So if surface rights are expressly withheld, that's a great result. Really, no need for further inquiry. Shouldn't be a problem for the project. If the, if the reservation uh, expressly grants surface rights, that's a problem that needs to be resolved. And if the instrument is silent about surface rights, that also needs to be dealt with because while, while state law does vary in this regard, uh, you know, many states, including California, the mineral estate holder actually has a very strong implied right to reasonable use of the surface, even if it's not expressly stated uh, in the instrument. So what issues does this cause when you have a mineral estate holder that has either express or, or implied surface rights? So it, these kind of fall in, in two categories. Number one is, is this kind of practical project issues. So you really don't want to have a, uh, you know, a, a company showing up on your site once you've been constructed and you have your whole uh, site covered in, in solar panels or, or wind turbines and collector lines and they say, hey, you know, we have these mineral rights and we want to we want to build these these big these big wells uh, on your property. Obviously, that'll be that you know that causes problems for for your operations. And, and number two, which may even be more important, is, is is financing issues because lenders, as we know, tend to be very conservative. And, and and when lenders see these kind of separate mineral rights, they really become very reluctant to finance your project unless you resolve the rights in a satisfactory manner. So what are some of the ways that, that you can resolve these, these, these issues? And so number one is you can actually go out and, and, and purchase the mineral estate or, or subsurface rights from the rights holders. Uh, so when you can do that, it's a very clean solution. You then, you then own all the rights, so there's no third party that can claim rights in the mineral estate. Uh, some of the issues here is uh, it can be hard to find all the rights holders, especially if the rights ownership is fractured. What we see a lot of times is that the original reservation will have been in favor of one party. Uh, that party may have died and, and, and the rights went out to a number of heirs. So, you know, we've seen this where we're dealing with, you know, 8, 12, 16 rights holders. Um, a good way to proceed here is, is you can engage uh, one, of, one of several mineral rights consulting firms who kind of have, have expertise in tracking down uh, these kind of rights. So what they'll do is, is they'll search for the current right holders, identify them, and they'll actually negotiate on your behalf for the acquisition of, of the rights. Uh, so again, this, this generally is going to require you to, to pay some money in exchange for the rights. Uh, it can be a little bit or it can be a lot, but that's a good, this is a great way of getting the rights fully resolved. Option two would be to, uh, to obtain a surface access rights waiver. Uh, which is instead of buying the entire rights, you, you're, you're basically acquiring a waiver uh, of the right to use the surface uh, for exploration. So you might ask, you know, why would someone do that? Well, it can be one of two things. You can say the waiver only applies for, you know, a certain period of time, i.e., the project life cycle, or if the rights holder uh, has some adjacent property, they can sometimes still access your mineral estate through techniques such as uh, horizontal drilling. And again, you know, so you have same issues here. You have to find the rights holders and you're going to have to pay something uh, for those rights. Option three would be to enter into some type of surface use agreement uh, with the rights holders. So here you, you basically agree with the rights holder upon a shared use of the surface. So you say, you know, this, this part of the property is going to be used for the development of the renewable project, and we're going to allow you to use this part of the property for for, for drilling. Uh, this sometimes costs money as well, but 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 often less than buying rights. Um, one of the downsides here is you have to actually negotiate these these kind of shared use agreements, and uh, that can take a while, especially when you're trying to do, to do them with many different rights holders. And then option four, I, I would say, is uh, is title insurance solutions. Uh, you know, title insurance companies are, are very conservative, and you know, no offense to any of our title company colleagues that are maybe here on the line today, but the general rule is going to be that they're going to resist issuance of coverage if there is any substantial possibility 
uh, of a claim being made for uh, by a rights holder. So you know, and another thing I would I would say here is, is certain certain title companies are developing kind of innovative solutions to this issue. Uh, I had a deal I worked on over the past couple of years where uh, the project site was was pretty advanced in development. There were a bunch of uh, mineral rights holders that we were having a very hard hard time locating. So the title company we were working with had a solution where we would we, we agreed with them that we would set aside a portion of the project site for kind of these future drill islands. So if the mineral rights holder ever shows up, uh, you know, we would allow them to use those areas. And on that basis, they were able to issue the, the title insurance coverage. Uh, so just to summarize, you know, seven mineral rights really are very common in a number of states. Uh, again, the key is to spot them early because they can sometimes be resolved or sometimes not, or at least not at a reasonable cost. And just the last caveat here is that state laws vary, so it's always important to check the laws of, of whatever state that your site is in. Uh, okay, so issue number two that we see pretty much on, on every site is the existence of third-party easements. And so just, just really, you know, real basically, what is an easement? It, an easement is the right of a third party to use another's property. It, it's basically a less a right than actual ownership. Uh, as far as kinds of easements, you'll see exclusive easements, which basically mean that, that the property owner or the lessee cannot have any improvements in or even access to the easement area. And the other type would be non-exclusive easements where the property owner or the lessee cannot unreasonably interfere with the use of the easement. Uh, the typical easements that you'll see are, you know, things for use, uh, utilities, you know, sewer lines, water lines, phone lines, electric lines. Uh, you'll see road easements where the county has reserved easement rights to build roads there in the future, or, or things like oil and gas pipelines. As far as how you spot these things, so again, the TADA report is going to tell you whether or not these easements exist. The problem is that it's often going to be hard to tell from the easement document the exact location of the easement because the document is going to generally have a what's known as a meets and bounds description. It'll say it'll have degrees and, 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 and minutes of angles and so it's going to be hard for you to tell exactly where these things are located. So how do you tell where these are? There's generally two options. Number one is to do a, a full ALTA survey with, which involves really a, a in-depth mapping of, of the entire site, including the precise easement location by a professional surveyor. The advantage here is that the survey is going to be required by the lender and the EPC contractor prior to financing and construction, so you're generally going to have to obtain one at some point. If advantage is these things can get very expensive, you know, ten, twenty thousand dollars and they do take some time. So option two which probably makes more sense when, you, when you're in the early development stage is you can ask the title company to plot the easements for you. Uh, this will take, this will probably be, you know, a few hundred dollars. Uh, it's very quick. You know, the accuracy is not guaranteed, but they're generally, you know, generally pretty accurate. So once you know where, you, where your site easements are located, you have to sit down and kind of analyze your options. So, this next slide, which is a little bit hard to see, but this, this is an easement plot from a title company from a site. And if you look at this, if you can see the areas that are, that are, that are cross-hatched in color or even marked in color are the easements. So you'll see on this site, there's an easement along the west side of the property, along the south side of the property, and there's one that kind of runs up from the southeast corner. And, and so just for a perspective, this is actually a pretty clean site. So option one, so now you know where your easements are, and the best way if you can do it is just to design around the easement. So the general rule is you're going to have to, you're going to, have to avoid uh, putting improvements in the, easements, in, in the easement areas. So if you can do it through design, which is very often feasible, you know, that's great. You say, okay, we're not going to put solar panels or, or turbines or, or lines in these areas. You can do that. Uh, you know, that's no problem. You know, the, uh, Kind of, that kind of redesign may affect your project output assumptions, so well, certainly it's good to know, you know, as soon as possible. Um, so, and then, so on occasion, you won't be able to, to design around the easements. You, you know, you say, I need to have my lines in this area, or I need to have some other kind of improvements in the area. So that's the scenario. Uh, you, you can try to contact the easement holders and negotiate for 
some kind of crossing rights uh, or encroachment agreement where they will actually consent to your placing of improvements um, in the easement area. And, you know, that's often successful as well. And if, if you only have a small number of easements, that generally is manageable. If you have a very large number of easements held by a number of parties, this can become a really big, a really big task. You know, we've seen deals where there's 100, 200 easements, and just, it's just a very long process to be able to approach all these people and, and get these kind of agreements signed up. So um, in that kind of scenario, that time and expense can, or that time can really cause cause a large delay. And option three here again uh, is title insurance solutions. This is really going to be on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, you know, for example, if the easement is 100 years old and the company that has the easement seems to no longer exist, you may be able to have the title company issue you affirmative uh, insurance coverage that will insure you against any damage caused by the exercise uh, by the easement holder of the easement right. Uh, so to just summarize this issue, you know, pretty much every site is going to be subject to at least a few easements. So you see easements is something you get too, too panicked about up front. Usually resolvable if the number and the, and the easement scope is not overly excessive. But again, you know, early spotting of the issue is key, especially if you're going to be required to approach a large number of these easement holders for uh, these kind of crossing rights agreements. And just again, you know, my, my overall theme here is, you know, project delay in equal project debt. So best to spot these issues as soon as you can and try to get them, you know, start, start the resolution process. All right, so thank, thank you all uh, uh, for your time today. I'm going to turn it over to Dottie, who's going to talk about navigable water and wetland issues. Thanks so much, Jason. Um, as Jason said, I'm going to be addressing navigable water and wetland issues today. Um, Generally speaking, if, you, if you, there's a there's a good likelihood that a project is going to um, impact wetlands areas, so it's a it's one of those topics that you need to be ahead of. Um, general, you know, Section 404 of the Clean Water Act regulates the discharge of dredged or fill material to navigable waters. Um, so, activity examples of activities that may be regulated include placing fill into a wetland, replacement of native materials back into a wetland clearing of wetlands, draining of wetlands, um, cutting, of wet, uh, wet, cutting of wetland vegetation. It seems straightforward enough, but the tricky part is actually figuring out where you may have a wetland regulated by the federal government and then what to do about it. So first step one is figuring out what are navigable, navigable waters that are, that are regulated. N Simply put, navigable waters are waters of the United States. Easy, right? Very helpful definition. Um, that's been pretty broadly interpreted by the courts. There's been a lot of debate over the interpretation for many years. Um, everything sort of came to a head with a couple of cases back in the 2000s, early in 2000s um, with the Solid Waste Agency of Northern Cook County versus the Army Corps and Rapanos versus the United States. Um, in the, the Swank opinion, um, a court found jurisdiction over a, a pond located in an abandoned quarry based on migratory birds' usage of that pond. Um, in Rapinos, the court came back and attempted to clarify, but ended up muddling things a bit. No, no majority opinion was reached, and, and so there's a couple of different standards out there. To clarify, um, EPA and the Army Corps came back and have, and have issued some guidance documents defining what they interpret as navigable waters, which includes waters that are currently used or were used in the past or may be susceptible to use in interstate commerce, all waters subject to ebb and flow to, of the tide, all interstate waters, um, interstate waters, um, all intrastate waters, the degradation or destruction of which would inter affect interstate commerce, and wetlands adjacent to all of those things. Um, Generally speaking, the Army Corps um, have indicated that they're going to to assert jurisdiction with that definition and then over other waters based on whether the waters bear a significant nexus to, to waters that are navigable. Still very confusing, but generally the, the take home is that that uh, um, that it's very broad jurisdiction. 
Um, so here's a few examples of waters that are typically not regulated. Converted cropland, artificial lakes and ponds that would revert to upland if irrigation ceases, artificial pools, gullies, swales, ditches, um, and things that don't connect to, uh, to, to navigable waters. Um, so this is just a, a helpful dis the depiction of where wetlands start. And if every, every water body looked like this, if we would have no, no trouble figuring out where wetlands are. Um, but you can see if there's a, if there's a um, navigable water running through the middle, you're generally going to have wetlands on either side. So, um, and the Army Corps defines wetlands in particular as uh, it looks for three factors in, in finding that there are wetlands in an area, looking for the presence of hydric soils, characteristic hydrogeology, and hydrophytic vegetation. So, you know, what, determination of wetlands is really um, a technical decision as much as anything, and it's it's a process to get Army Corps to sign off on whether or not. Uh, or to get to do a jurisdictional delineation so that you can verify where let, wetlands exist. Once the Army Corps issues a wetlands delineation, it's typically valid for five years. So that's an option to proceed. But where you need to move faster and getting a, a wetlands delineation is going to be too time consuming, there are a few ways to um, get a preliminary jurisdictional determination um, to avoid or at least postpone some complexities as associated with formal delineations. So now I just want to talk a bit about wh what exactly the, the Army Corps and the US EPA regulate concerning wetlands. Uh, Army Corps issues permits, which we've sort of touched on, we'll go into a little bit more detail about shortly. They conduct and verify the jurisdictional determinations as we discussed, and they also manage enforcement of wetlands issues. EPA is actually the agency responsible for developing and interpreting the, the environmental criteria to evaluate permit applications. With the Corps, they verify jurisdictional determinations. They may also manage enforcement. And EPA actually has veto authority over permits. It's a veto authority that they use very rarely. Um, in fact, it's only been used 11 times out of 1.6 million permit applications between 1979 and 2005, but it is nonetheless an authority that they have. So do you need to get a 404 permit? Basically, you need to identify whether there's a discharge of fill or dredge material into waters in the United States. And I then, once you've determined that you meet that criteria, identify any exemptions or general permits that may apply and then potentially ev evaluate means to avoid damage, minimize impacts, or compensate for losses. It's really important to note that there's a difference between fill and dredge material. Um, fill is, is material originating from outside the waters of the United States that you bring in to alter the surface elevation of the waters. Dredged is just material from that, um, from that water body that's being stirred back up. There is a de minimis exception for um, placement of dredged material into water bodies um, that are where, where it's incidental to um, to activities, but there is not such a such a, um, a de, minimis, de minimis type exception for fill material. So it's an important distinction to keep in mind as you're thinking about projects. So um, Army Corps go, is going to issue. Um, projects, 404 permits for projects. There's two broad categories of, of permits that they would issue. One is a general permit. These are either nationwide or regional permits that, um, that deal with um, activities that are similar in nature and will cause only minimal adverse environmental impacts. And then if you don't qualify for or your project doesn't qualify for or a particular aspect of the project doesn't qualify for a general permit, um, then there are individual permits, which are project-specific and have strict procedural requirements um, in, to, in order to get them. Um, the individual permits generally in, involve a pre-application meeting, an application meeting, or an applicant submittal of an application, public comment period, and a public interest review. The good thing about general permits, in addition to just being a little bit more streamlined, is that they normally do not require advance notice to the Corps, but there are some pretty notable exceptions, and we'll be, just, we'll be addressing a couple of those shortly. So 
Whether or not a permit gets issued is based on EPA's guidance, as we discussed a little bit, and that's the 404B1 standard, which can really be summed up to, be, to say, generally, the Army Corps is only going to permit the least environmentally damaging practicable alternative. An alternative is practical, practicable if it's available and capable of being done after taking into consideration cost, existing technology, and logistics in light of the project purpose. An area that is not owned by the project applicant, but that could reasonably be obtained to fulfill the basic purpose of the project may be considered as an alternative. It's important to remember that for special aquatic sites, an applicant must rebut a presumption that, the, that there is an alternative site that a non-aquatic site exists and an alternative site will result in less adverse environmental impacts on the aquatic ecosystem. Since, since this, this presumption exists for wetlands and special ex aquatic sites, people tend to be much more sensitive um, when dealing with wetlands issues. It's just a higher burden to definitely be careful of. So general permits. There, in 2012, two new um, general permits for renewable energy projects were developed. Um, one is Net Nationwide Permit 51, which covers land-based renewable ener energy generation facilities. The second is Nationwide Permit 52 for water-based renewable energy generation pilot projects. Um, both may be used for projects up to a half an acre in size or one that will impact no more than 300 linear feet of stream bed. N Nationwide Permit 51 covers the installation of renewable energy structures and related features roads, parking lots, utility lines. Um, nationwide Permit 52 covers only pilot projects, water-based wind or hydrokinetic projects, and um, has a limitation of 10 generation units. Um, and it's only a pilot project is defined as one where the units are going to be monitored to collect information on their performance and environmental effects. The problem with these two permits is that they both require advance notice to the Army Corps and advance approval from the Army Corps. So while there's actually a more streamlined process, this still does involve notice and approval prior to, um, prior to getting started, unlike some of the other general permits. Pre-construction notification is an issue in and of itself. It definitely has the potential to slow things down significantly. The Army Corps has 30 days from the time of submittal in which to notify the applicant of a deficiency. Activity cannot begin until 45 days from the Re Army Corps' receipt of a complete application or complete pre-construction notification. And if approval is required, as is the case with um, permits 51 and 52, then activity cannot begin until the applicant receives written approval for the project. So it, it, that could be a potentially longer delay. So. Another alternative to consider is that there's a couple of general permits and older general permits that don't require pre-construction notification that could be used to cover at least parts of renewable energy projects without, um, without the pre-construction notification. One is Nationwide Permit 12, which covers utility line activities, and Nationwide Permit 14, which covers linear transportation projects like roads. Um, notice that Nationwide Permit 14 doesn't cover ancillary features. It's strictly roads, highways railways, trails, et cetera. Um, for both, there's some pre-construction notification required. And in particular, it's important to notice that pre-construction notification is required if there are wetland loss, there are going to be wetland losses greater than a tenth of an acre in size. Remember that no matter what permits you pursue, you have to pay attention to general conditions issued for the permits. Some general conditions require pre-construction notification for other reasons. Um, so just because you're operating under Nationwide Permit 12, for example, and you're not um, a tenth of an acre, not destroying a tenth of an acre of wetlands, doesn't mean that you don't have pre-construction notification requirements. Another piece of this whole process that you need to pay special attention to is going to be mitigation. You figured out that there's a permit. Now you need to worry about mitigation. Com compensatory mitigation is required for all wetland losses that exceed a tenth of an acre and require pre-construction notification, unless the Army Corps issues a written notification that other mitigation would be more environmentally appropriate or that the adverse effect of the activity is minimal. For activity that uh, affects less than a tenth of an acre, the, there's still pre 
but that, requ that requires pre-construction notification for other reasons, which would be anything under permits um, 51 and 52, the district engineer has discretion to determine that compensatory mitigation is required. So basically, if you're submitting a pre-construction notification for any reason, they can come back and require um, mitigation for, for that project. Factors that the Army Corps is likely to consider when determining what kind of mitigation to require is the likelihood of ecological success and sustainability, comparison of location and significance of mitigation versus impact site, and the cost of the mitigation proj project. There's a regulatory preference for same watershed and restoration mitigation. Um, there's also a preference for in-kind mitigation. Mid the, the key to it all is that mitigation must provide at least the same, if not more, aquatic function than that which is being lost by the activity. So what does that all really mean? Basically, there's a couple of strategies for pursuing mitigation. And in order of preference by the agency, um, the things you can pursue are um, mitigation bank credits. I've, on the slide here, you see a picture that includes, that shows some of the mitigation banks in Florida. Um, and obviously, that would be a, a payment into another um, entity that's operating those mitigation banks. Um, secondly, an in-lieu fee program credits, which again is a payment into, to an entity, um, government or otherwise, that's operating some kind of mitigation. And then the lesser preferences are for permittee-led mitigation with a stronger, stronger view taken of on-site or in-kind mitigation and a lesser view taken of off-site or out-of-kind mitigation. That's, the, that's a, a quick overview of things to consider when you're looking at wetland issues for a project, um, an, an alternative energy project, but a few take-home concepts to remember. Clean Water Act jurisdiction is really broad. Don't rely on a casual assessment of jurisdiction. Even if it doesn't, to you, seem to be connected to navigable waterways, it doesn't mean that the government isn't going to take a position that it is. Um, secondly, if a project can qualify for coverage under multiple permits, try and choose the permit or permits or, or use multiple permits that will minimize notice and approval requirements in order to speed up the process. And even if you uh, believe a project is covered under a general permit, carefully review general conditions that may trigger notification requirements. Again, remembering that pre-construction notification can slow things down. And when mitigating for impacts, advanced coordination with the agency can really minimize some delays over, um, over choosing the, the right mitigation strategy. And that's all I have for today before I turn it over to Sarah Slack. Thank you, Dottie. Um, I'm going to be talking today about quite a few things, it looks like. Um, but as you'll see, there's quite a bit of overlap between the elements of these statutes. So I'm going to be talking about the National Environmental, Pol excuse me, National Environmental Policy Act, that should say, uh, Endangered Species Act, and the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act. So first, we're going to start with the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA as it's called. So the purpose of NEPA was to create a process for informed and involved decision making. There are really two big elements to NEPA. The first is that it's supposed to ensure that federal agencies carefully consider the potential environmental consequences of their actions prior to making a decision and prior to making a commitment of any type of federal resources. And the second really important element of NEPA is that it provides the public with an opportunity to be involved and participate by providing them with information and then also part, uh, opportunities for participation. So now who's in charge under NEPA? Well, the, the lead agency is in charge. Basically, if there is a project that's going to require a NEPA uh, type process, then whichever agency is proposing that action is going to be uh, in charge. So that can vary uh, from project to project. It can be the Department of Transportation. It can be uh, the Bureau of Land Management. It can be uh, Fish and Wildlife Services, Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, you name the, the federal agency, and they could end up being in charge under NEPA. So then what's the tri trigger for NEPA? As I said earlier, it's agency action. The statutory language is any major federal actions significantly affecting the quality of the human environment. So that's pretty, pretty broad. But but it has to be a major federal action, and it has to significantly affect the quality of the human environment. So those are, those are the two kind of uh, important factors. And there, there are certain actions that are considered categorically excluded. The regulations set forth a definition of categorical exclusion. 
that means uh, the category of actions which do not individually or cumulatively have a significant effect on the human environment. So basically, they're not going to be subject to the NEPA process. Now, specific categorical exclusions are set out in various agency guidance and regulation. Um, and examples of some activities that are considered categorical exclusions uh, include like fixing fences along roads, um, some minimal landscaping type activities, um, or rehabilitating wet wetlands. And you know, as with anything, um, there are sometimes exceptions to the exclusions. Uh, so there, there may be on a case-by-case -case basis a situation where um, you know, maybe fixing a fence would somehow raise to the level of, of a major federal action. Um, and so you know, just be aware that the categorical exclusions exist, but there can be exceptions to the exclusions. OK, so then the NEPA process. So the way that it flows through is, again, you have to first determine if there's a, f a federal action. The federal action has to be the proximate cause of the potential significant impact. So if the federal action isn't really going to cause the significant impact on the environment, then, um, then NEPA wouldn't necessarily be triggered. Another factor that's important is whether or not there's agency discretion in the, in the action. So if, uh, if an agency has a form that you fill out and if you check a box and pay a fee uh, and then you get a permit, then there's really no agency discretion. Um, it's only where the agency exercises some sort of discretion that NEPA is going to get triggered. The next step in the process is determine if there's a categorical exclusion, like we just discussed. And then following that, if, if there is no categorical exclusion, the uh, evaluation moves forward to determine whether or not there's a significant impact. Um, now there's a process, there are a couple of different processes involved. There can be an initial process where you go through an environmental assessment to determine whether there may be a, an impact. Uh, if, uh, if the result of that environmental assessment is that there is not likely to be an impact, then the agency would generally issue a finding of no significant impact. However, if the result of the environmental assessment is that there could be, then uh, you end up triggering the full environmental impact statement process. So again, who's responsible? It's going to be the lead agency and cooperating agency agencies. So uh, oftentimes, uh, again, the lead agency is the lead federal agency. But then cooperating agencies can be other federal agencies, and they can also be state agencies as well. So the NEPA process, one of the most important parts of it is the scoping process. Make sure that everyone who is involved has a stake um, it has a chance to participate. Um, this, is, this is particularly important with NEPA because, as I uh, indicated earlier, one of the main, main uh, elements of NEPA is to provide the public with the opportunity to have access to this information and to participate. And then as the, the uh, environmental impact statement is developed, um, there are a variety of different uh, factors that need to be evaluated and included. And for purposes of our discussion today, I've just listed some of them that are the most, um, most relevant. So. Um, an EAS has to include a discussion of environmental impact of, of the proposed actions. So that includes direct, indirect, and cumulative effects. Uh, for, instance, for an example, in the uh, renewable sector, um, a direct effect may be the effect of actually putting a turbine you know, right there, boom. Um, an indirect effect may be the uh, increased traffic on roads leading to the site. Um, and then cumulative effects could be uh, you know, you're proposing a wind farm in a certain area and 20 miles you know, south, there's another large wind project. And, and just the cumulative effects of, of all of those and how those could affect the environment. In addition, your EIS is going to have to include an analysis of multiple alternatives, so including a no-action alternative. Again, looking at it from the context of a renewable project, this may be if you have a plot of land where you're going to put solar panels. Uh, looking at a variety of different options for placement of those panels, uh, different uh, options for accessing the site. So it's going to require that you, you evaluate uh, multiple alternatives. And then in addition, it's going to require discussion of the adverse environmental effects that cannot be avoided. So ultimately, uh, the environmental impact statement chooses a preferred alternative. Now, the preferred alternative does not have to be the alternative with the least environmental impact. Uh, it can actually be chosen, um, it actually, in choosing it, the, um, the lead agency balances a variety of factors. It looks at the environmental impacts the economic impacts, the benefit of the project, and the social and cultural uh, impacts as well. So it's a balancing. Again, NEPA mandates a process, not a decision. And ultimately, it's the lead agency that has the final say as to what the preferred alternative will be. OK, so quickly, I just wanted to go through some best practices that, um, or lessons learned about, about NEPA. The first is something we hear a lot in the renewables industry, and that's just because it's green doesn't mean it's clean. Uh, and again, you, you've probably heard that before, and basically it just means 
just because the renewable are uh, a great um, alternative to traditional fossil fuel sources for energy, it doesn't mean they're clean. It doesn't mean that they aren't going to have some environmental impacts to, um, to wetlands, as Dottie talked about. about or to species, as I'm about to talk about. So you know, the NEPA process will, will evaluate that. Another, uh, another thing to think about is to start early. I think that's going to be a common theme throughout all of the presentations today. Um, it, just don't underestimate the timeline that's required to comply with NEPA. And uh, you, you know, the, the sooner you get people involved, the more cooperative and the happy they generally are. Um, another thing to consider with, uh, with respect to NEPA is timing and strategy. And here I have environmental assessment versus environmental impact statement. If you have a project that you are pretty sure is going to have a significant effect on the environment and will ultimately require an EIS, you can skip the environmental assessment uh, process and go right to full EIS. Um, and again, that's just a timing and strategic thing, uh, decision that needs to be made. Uh, if, like, if, if it seems obvious that you're going to go the route of an EIS, then it may make sense uh, from timing and from a resource perspective to just go directly to that. So under NEPA, mitigation is not required. But if the agency does decide to use it and relies upon it and it's selecting its preferred alternative, then the measures have to be fully developed. Basically, what this means is that uh, an agency can't say uh, in, in its preferred alternative, well, this could possibly be an issue, but if it is, we'll require mitigation of some sort. If the agency is going to say that it's going to require uh, mitigation of some sort, then it has to be uh, fully fleshed out in the, in the text of the EIS. Uh, another element or another factor to consider is to be prepared to cooperate with the lead agency. And I have cooperate, cooperate in uh, quotes here because cooperate actually generally means that you're going to be providing a lot of the data and possibly um, some of the actual written work product of what will go into the EIS. Um, federal agencies have limited budgets, limited staff, and uh, a lot on their plate. And uh, oftentimes, project proponents end up being very actively involved in preparation of EIS um, to, to just keep things moving forward. Finally, as with many environmental issues, uh, just be thoughtful about the potential for legal challenges. These come up uh, very often. Uh, you can get a challenge to, um, to the, the validity of a determination or the process, and uh, making sure that you Dot your I's and cross your T's is very important in NEPA compliance. Next, moving on, we're going to talk about the Endangered Species Act. The Endangered Species Act is different from NEPA in a variety of ways, but the biggest difference is that it's not a process. It's actually um, there, there's substance to this act. So the purpose of it is to protect plant and animal life, to prevent extinction, and it's, uh, it does that through policies and regulations that are designed to recover endangered and threatened species and to maintain populations. So who's in charge under the ESA? Uh, the US Fish and Wildlife Service and then the National Marine Fisheries Service, or NIMFS, uh, both have the authority to list species under, uh, under the Endangered Species Act. And then there's also a role for consulting agencies. And I'll talk about that more um, in a little bit. But under Section 7, of the Endangered Species Act, federal agencies must consult with Fish and Wildlife Service if issuance of a federal permit may impact the listed species. So there, there is a role for other federal agencies to play in the administration of this act. So the listing process. I'm going to go through this kind of quickly, uh, just as some background. So FWS and NIMS have uh, the ability to list endangered species. That process can either be initiated by the agency or by a petition uh, generally from a, a non-governmental entity uh, with an interest in that species. There are a variety of different factors that are evaluated in determining whether or not to list a species. Um, but I think the most significant and the one that most often comes up in the context of renewables projects is that clients are frequently surprised that for listing purposes, um, you, can't consider excuse me, you can't consider economic impacts. So regardless of the cost to list a species, if it merits protection, it gets listed. Now, that's different from critical habitat. 
critical, critical habitat is habitat that the agency designates as necessary for a species to recover. And when designating critical habitat, the agency may consider economic impacts. In 2011, there was uh, a listing settlement that occurred. What happened was that FWS entered a settlement with, uh, it was of multiple cases that had been, brought, had been brought by various environmental groups seeking to have FWS list species. The issue is that FWS acknowledged that some of the species um, that, that were waiting for uh, assessment merited listing, but they just didn't have the time or recesses, excuse me, resources to go through the listing process. So under the settlement, FWS uh, must make listing decisions on 261 species by 2018. So the listing process is going to be uh, something that we're going to see a lot of in the next couple years. And there may be, uh, you know, I think I've seen estimates of up to 50 species a year that may be listed in the next uh, six years. So the crux of the Endangered Species Act is its take prohibition. Under the Endangered, <coughs> excuse me, under the Endangered Species Act, uh, any person is prevented from harassing, harming, pursuing, hunting, shooting, wounding, killing, trapping, capturing, or collecting a listed animal or fish. Now note that this, the take prohibition does not apply to plants. Um, and then harm has been broadly interpreted to include habitat modification in certain circumstances. So if, you, if it's proven that the habitat modification will actually result in the death or actual injuries of, uh, injury of a species um, or to a listed, of a listed species, and that, uh, that the harm, uh, that the habitat modification is going to be the proximate cause. So what if there is a potential for, uh, what if there are, if there's a potential for listed species to be within a project area? Here again, the value of early surveys uh, is very important. Um, the sooner you, as soon as you start looking at, at a potential site, it's valuable to get an idea about what potential endangered species may be at that site. Um, again, there's timing and strategy considerations involved with this. The sooner you start looking, the sooner you can make sure that you're making an informed decision um, about, about whether or not to pursue a site. Now, if there are or if there is a potential for listed species, the next step is going to be uh, either a consultation under Section 7 or a habitat conservation plan and incidental take permits under Section 10. So Section 7 consultation, the trigger is a project that requires a federal permit. So again, this is, this is a si situation where um, there would possibly be a lead federal agency. So if, uh, if a project was going to re require a permit from the Army Corps of Engineers in order to fill wetlands to, to do a project, then that would trigger uh, the consultation requirement under Section 7. Now the Section 7 standard is a jeopardy standard. And what that is, is it means that no action that would likely jeopardize the continued existence of a species or adversely modify its, hab its critical habitat is, is permitted. But if there's no jeopardy, then the agency can only require reasonable and prudent measures. So there's, there's two steps to, or possibly two steps to a consultation under step, Section 7. There's an informal consultation and then a formal consultation. The informal con con consultation involves the preparation of a biological assessment. And the purpose of that is for the lead agency to work with FWS to determine if the proposed action is likely to affect species. If it's not likely to affect species, uh, and that's the conclusion of the biological assessment, then, that is, uh, then the requirements under the Endangered Species Act are complete, and no further analysis is necessary. But if the result of the biological assessment is that the action is likely to affect species, then the formal consultation process is triggered. Under the formal consultation process, the FWS works with the lead agency to assess whether the proposed action will jeopardize the survival and recovery of a species in the wild. So in looking at uh, the possible jeopardy issue, the, the Fish and Wildlife Service will work with the lead agency to evaluate various alternatives, to look at the purpose of the project, the technical and economic feasibility of different alternatives, and with the goal of avoiding jeopardy. If adverse effects will not have a jeopardy, uh, will not jeopardize the species, um, but may have adverse effects on that species, then the, uh, the ultimate biological opinion that is issued by the Fish and Wildlife Service may have an incidental take statement. An incidental take statement would allow the taking of a species um, so long as it was within certain uh, parameters that would be set forth in the take statement. 
A thing that's uh, a factor that's important to know about consultation under Section 7 is that no independent NEPA review is required. So if, uh, if you go through Section 7 consultation, you don't have to go through the NEPA process. Um, well, at least for the species, there may be other permits required. And then another interesting fact about Section 7 is that uh, the consulting agency has the final say, ultimately, as to, uh, as to whether or not to move forward with the proposed action. So uh, the alternative to Section 7 consultation is Section 10 consultation. And the trigger here is the development in an area of uh, listed species, but the project does not require any fed other federal permits. So there's no, there's no federal agency to consult on behalf of the project proponent. It's just, just the project proponent going to the Fish and Wildlife Service to, to seek this. The standard under, under Section 10 is different than the standard under Section 7. Under Section 10, you have to demonstrate that, um, that you're, to the maximum extent practicable, minimizing and mitigating impacts of the taking. And show that you have to show that adequate funding is available and that the take will not appreciably reduce the likelihood of survival and recovery of the listed species. So again, that's, that's a pretty dis distinct difference, um, a, a jeopardy finding versus a maximum extent practicable. practicable. Under Section 10, a party would have to prepare and fund a habitat conservation plan, an HCP. The purpose of these is to minimize and mitigate the take of the species. It includes a plan to protect the species in an area and to facilitate their recovery. And again, it must be funded. So if you, uh, if you propose to have a project that has a 50-year duration and you have a 50-year uh, HCP, then you'd need to make sure that you could demonstrate the funding mechanism to uh, comply with all the elements of that HCP during the, the life of it. The mitigation measures that uh, FWS is going to look for under Section 10 is this is the order that they'll look at them. First, they're going to look to have parties avoid impacts. Then they're going to look to have them minimize impacts. Then they're going to look to have them rectify impacts, reduce impacts, and finally compensate for impacts. So mitigation is generally required under HCPs and ITPs, and, um, and there's generally a cost associated with that. So under Section 10, the FWS has the final say uh, with respect to whether or not to approve an HCP and issue uh, an incidental take permit. One benefit of this pr uh, process is that there is a no surprises all assurances provision, which basically is that if unforeseen circumstances arise, then FWS will not require additional land, water, or other natural, resor natural resources beyond the HCP without the consent of the permittee. And the government will honor the no surprises assurances provision so long as uh, the, the applicant is following the HCP. So that's the benefit there. A couple of take homes on the Endangered Species Act. Um, start early. Uh, again, it's a theme. Uh, another thing is an ounce of prevention. Uh, here, you know, surveys may seem expensive and time consuming up front, but they may be less expensive than the alternatives, which could include reduction in units placed in the field, relocation of species, or reestablishment of species. Those are, those are costs that can be very expensive. Um, again, something to think about is the difficulty of proving the negative. So if there is suitable habitat, it may be easier to assume a species is present. If you want to um, just keep moving things along, then maybe it makes sense to just assume that a species is present and go through the consultation process or begin the process under Section 10, rather than spending several years trying to prove the negative that a species is not there. Um, another option is to consider participating in the listing process. And that would be, um, you know, you could, you could submit comments and participate, but there are also options for what are called candidate conservation agreements or candidate conservation agreements with assurances. A candidate conservation agreement is a formal voluntary agreement between a property owner and FWS under which the, the, uh, the property owner agrees to implement certain measures uh, at its property to protect a species that's a uh, potential listed species. Uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a candidate conservation agreement with assurances is similar, but it also includes uh, certain conservation actions that if they're implemented by the property owner, then FWS commits to not require anything additional on that property for that species. Here is just a quick uh, comparison of Section 7 versus Section 10, uh, some of the kind of key differences between the two. Um, again, the, the trigger for the two is, is a little different. The lead agency can be different, so be thoughtful about you know, possible form shopping. 
a significant factor is the time limit. Under Section 7, with the various um, timelines for submitting information and uh, responses, the total timeline is 195 days. Um, and that might seem long until you realize that under Section 10, there is no time limit. HCPs can take years to develop. So that's something to be thoughtful about as well. The standard is also different. That's an important change or difference between the two. Again, the no jeopardy alternative versus the maximum extent practicable. Um, another significant difference here is the NEPA difference. Under Section 7, you do not re you're not required to go through with NEPA as well. But under Section 10, you would be required to comply with NEPA. And then there's the benefit of the assurances. There are no assurances under Section 7, um, and there are under Section 10. So it's just a matter of evaluating your project and looking strategically at, at the differences between those two and as to what would make sense. All right, I'm going to quickly also go through some uh, issues on the Bald and Gold Golden Eagle Protection Act. Um, it is similar to the ESA uh, in that it is process instead of substance. An interesting difference is that bald eagles were delisted from the Endangered Species Act in 2007, and golden eagles have never been listed. So this is just a statute that's designed to intend these birds that we've decided are, are important to us. Um, and then who's in charge? That's uh, FWS. Similar to the Endangered Species Act, Big Eba has a take prohibition that is uh, statutorily defined. And the disturbance of an eagle is pretty broadly defined. It, it includes things like agitating or bothering a bald eagle, and uh, it can also include you know, um, injury to a bald eagle or a decrease in its productivity um, in factors including you know, nest abandonment or any substantial interference with breeding. So it's a pretty broad definition of disturb. So in 2009, after the eagle was delisted uh, from the Endangered Species Act, uh, FWS had the new regulations that came out that created a permitting scheme for a take of an eagle that is the result of an otherwise lawful activity. There uh, are two possible options for permits. The first is an individual take permit. Uh, those are permits that uh, would be for uh, an individual project that was limited in time and location. And then the other alternative is a programmatic take permit, which are permits that uh, occur um, when there is an unavoidable take, even though advanced conservation practices are being implemented. And the term for that per those permits are for a period of five years. So some big EPA best practices slash lessons learned. Again, start early. Um, and also an ounce of prevention. So make sure you're aware of the potential for um, eagles in your, uh, in your project area. Also, NEPA compliance may be triggered if you are required to get uh, a permit under, um, under the GEPA. And then in 2012, uh, there was a new proposed rule that FWS came out with. And it was to extend the programmatic permit term for 30 years. Uh, a five-year term is a pretty short term for a programmatic take, which you know the best example of that would be a renewable wind project, um, where obviously that project is going to be operating for a number of years longer than five years, hopefully. And so a five-year period for the permit is, is a pretty short time period. So there is a current proposed rule that would extend that for up to 30 years. Interestingly, to date, there have been no programmatic permits issued yet. So um, you know, it'll, it'll be interesting to see how, how those play out. Uh, and finally, there's some question about the um, coordination b with the Endangered Species Act and the Fish and Wildlife Service guidelines that Tanya is about to talk about. And that uncertainty is if you go through the process and comply with all of that, and if you get uh, a Section 10 Habitat Conservation Plan, um, would that cover eagles, or would you also need to uh, get a BGIPA programmatic permit, possibly? And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tanya. Thanks, Sarah. Before I discuss the new wind energy guidelines, I need to provide the following announcement. Those seeking New York or New Jersey CLE credit are required to email the following five-digit code to Jennifer Bart at the following email address, jbartz, J-B-A-R-T-Z, at foley.com. You can also find this address on the last slide or the first slide of the presentation. The code is 23B as in boy, F as in Frank, I as in ice cream. So 23BFI. This code is only needed for those requesting CLE in New York or New Jersey, 
One more time, those seeking New York or New Jersey CLE credit are required to email the following five-digit code to jbartsatfoley.com. The code is 23BFI. Upon receipt of your email, Jennifer will reply with an attorney affirmation form that needs to be completed and mailed back to her at the address on the form within one week of this program date. So now on to the wind energy guidelines. Um, we want to be respectful of your time and realize that we are running a little over here, so I will quickly go through um, these last few slides. This new wind energy guidelines came out about just about a year ago. It is the update to the former 2003 guide guidance. It was a result of a collaborative effort and a consideration of public comments. The goals are listed there for you. Basically, in sum, the hope is that if the guidelines are used with the appropriate regulatory tools, you will have the best practical approach for conservation of species with regard to wind projects. Uh, as Sarah discussed, the statutes that come into play and how these all work together um, and how to work through the process are the ESC, the BGIPA, and then the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. The goal, again, is the um, protection of the various species. This is a tiered approach. So it's an iterative process. It has five tiers. You work from one tier, beginning obviously in one, and then working your way through. It's, the idea is that there is an opportunity for evaluation and decision making in a cooperative effort with fish and wildlife. Um, it, is, it is definitely encouraging people to get involved earlier with the agency, which we would always suggest is, is the way to do it. Um, under the guidelines, Fish and Wildlife will respond to requests within 60 calendar days. So I know there's concern that this will slow down the process, but the guidelines were put together with you know, that input that we needed this to move along, and so there is provisions for quickly responding. These are the five tiers. The first three tiers are all pre-construction tiers. So when developers are working to identify, avoid, and minimize the risk the species of concern. These are the tiers that they're going to work through. Um, the preliminary site evaluation, just to note, is a focus on the actual location. It is not at that point a focus on the size of the project. They really want the developers to focus on what is, what habitats, what species, what, what special things are in that location of the project and really analyze that before they start talking about the size. Um, and just to make sure everyone understands, a project means all phases of a wind energy development. So the project, what needs to be analyzed is, you know, the site, the construction, the operation, the decommissioning, the infrastructure, and even the interconnection with the electrical lines. That's all part of the project. And then the project site is going to be the land and airspace where the project occurs. So it's a pretty big area that needs to be um, assessed. Then for Tier 4 and 5, this is where the developers or the operators are assessing whether these actions that they took in the earlier tiers are successful and if they are being successful in avoiding and minimizing the impact or whether additional steps need to be taken. Not every tier or every element within each tier needs to be implemented. It's going to be very specific to the project. The guidelines, you just basically walk through them as far as if, if a happens, then you go to B. If A doesn't happen, then you might go to C. Um, and then at each tier, you're going to evaluate, you know, what additional data do I need? If I go to the next tier, what needs to be done? The guidelines are voluntary. Um, it doesn't, you know, complying with these guidelines is not going to substitute for NEPA compliance or Endangered Species Act compliance, but they will consider fish and wildlife um, an enforcement proceeding would consider adherence to the guidelines um, as a mitigating factor. One practice point to keep in mind is that you need to keep really good records to demonstrate that you adhered to the guidelines. Um, so you're going to want to keep you know, notes about what was done for each tier, what the decisions were made, what they were based on, as well as copies of communication. And an important thing to consider if you are the developer or the operator and you're not the same entity after construction, so the project's developed by someone sold to an operator, the operator's going to want to make sure that they have sufficient records from the developer of what was done to adhere to the guidelines, as well as keeping their own records of what they've done. Um, so really the focus 
of the guidance, guidance and the driving force is to get early involvement, early communication with fish and wildlife. And this really is going to give the best outcome um, for everybody. It's going to help um, prevent surprises and avoid costs either due to delay or takes. Um, this, you know, this is how we would recommend that you would work through one of these projects anyway, um, and it's kind of it's helping everybody to get into that process and to think through through the project starting earlier in consultation with Fish and Wildlife. Um, and at that point, I will turn it over to Jennifer Bart. Hey. Thanks, everybody, for being on the call this afternoon. I'm going to wrap things up for the hour. Uh, we invite you to contact any of our speakers if you have additional questions or would like more information on the particular topics as we were not able to get to the Q&A portion uh, this afternoon. Just a reminder that a recording of today's program as well as the PowerPoint slides will be available on Foley's website by early next week. If you have questions regarding CLE for this program, please contact me. Jennifer Bart at jbartz at foleygot.com. And don't forget, those seeking New York and New Jersey CLE credit are required to complete the attorney affirmation form. Just email the five-digit code that was announced earlier in the program to jbart at foley.com to get a copy of the form, or you can also download it by clicking the Download Files button along the right-hand side of your screen. Finally, please take a minute or two to give us your feedback about the presentation today using the survey that appears in your internet browser window. It's important to us to know your thoughts and help us shape our program as we go forward for future programs. Thank you again, and this concludes our program. And thank you for your participation.